You're listening to the No Schedule Man podcast with Kevin Bomer, exploring real stories and lessons learned with a variety of special guests. To learn more about Kevin and to access other episodes of the podcast, please visit noschedulemen.com and connect and contribute at No Schedule Man on Twitter or Instagram and on Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud, all backslash No Schedule Man. Thanks for listening and enjoy the No Schedule Man podcast. I've been known to struggle with reality. It's not that it is any real mystery. Hi, I'm Kevin Bolmer. Welcome to the show and thank you so much for finding us. I hope you're having a great day. I hope that this program adds a little something to it. Today, my guest is Derek Rock Botton, my great good friend, one of my most treasured friends in the entire world. Derek was actually the featured guest of the very first episode of the No Schedule Man podcast, and that actually is part of the reason why I asked him back, and I'm going to explain why (laughs) in just a couple moments. As far as tossing a label on Derek as opposed to wonderful person, gentle and incredible soul, broadcasting legend in the radio field in the area where I live, the former operator of a a wonderful motorcycle trade show called the World of Motorcycles Expo here in London, Ontario, Canada, Uh, a motorcycle enthusiast and instructor, an incredible mechanic, tinkerer, creator, (laughs) a guy who can get lost for hours in his shop and come out with incredible creations aside from any of those kinds of things husband maybe his his wife lisa might like me to toss that label on him too (laughs) i'm not much one for labels but just to give you some context i think derek would also probably call himself or refer to himself now at least in part as a tremendously talented voiceover talent and voice actor he lends his his voice talent to commercials and videos voice characterizations for video games and productions, audiobooks, and much, much, much more. Some of the things that he creates, pieces of furniture, lights, fixtures, just really cool bric-a-brac of all kind. And forgive me, bric-a-brac doesn't do any justice to the, the incredible things that Derek is creating. A lot of those are, are available for sale, and you can find them actually on his wife's website, Lisa Brandt, voiceoflisabrandt.com. If you go to the shop page on her site, you'll find what she calls Lisa's Pieces. Well, much of that, most of that probably, is actually uh, stuff that's been created by Derek, who you're, just going to, who you're going to hear from in just a couple of minutes. You can also listen to some of what Derek has done with his voice talent online at derekbotten.com. So he's D-E-R-E-K. B O T T E N, Derek Botten.com. So, back to why I asked Derek to come back. There's a couple of reasons. There are a couple of reasons. Well, one, when I started the podcast and I asked Derek to help me out to just get it going, I just wanted somebody to talk to. And I was thinking, well, three things. Number one, I knew Derek would say yes. <laughs> Bless his heart. Number two, I thought, since he and I used to work together, indeed, this is where we met and became friends as announcers at a stock car racetrack called Delaware Speedway, that it would be a natural jumping off point for the two of us to just tell stories and reminisce about our time together announcing uh, at the racetrack. It's one of the very few times I've ever deliberately manipulated the discussion for this podcast. In other words, choosing or having chosen a subject matter beforehand. Every other episode after that has all been basically just exploring somebody else's journey. And then all of a sudden, the the whole point of why I was doing this sort of showed itself to me. So that very first episode with Derek is a little bit of an outlier in that it's like, hey, here's two guys talking about the racetrack. But the third reason why I did that, very (laughs) ego-driven when I was just trying to get started, is that I thought that there would be some people that know me and that know Derek and remember us from the racetrack that might like listening to that conversation. And as it turns out, at least to some degree, I was right on all of those counts. And the gift that Derek gave to me by doing that, as I think I mentioned in this conversation, which you're going to hear in just a moment, is that when we had that conversation and I listened back to it, and it had been a long time, even though I've got a significant background in radio broadcasting, not as much as Derek has, but I've spent some time on the airwaves as well. When I listened back to that conversation with he and I for that first podcast episode, it felt like having a missing part of me reattached. I immediately felt like I'd put on whatever cliche you want to use, like a pair of old comfortable shoes, but there was just something that lit back up in me 
that had not been feeling the same way prior to that point. And that was just an incredible gift and then I continued to march on from there. But as I mentioned, the podcast kind of took on a bit of a different tone after it. It became about personal development and about the, exploring the journey of different people and what are some of the challenges that they have overcome and why are they passionate about what they do and all of those kinds of things. And it's been a tremendous experience talking to people about all that. Well, the irony is that I had Derek at my kitchen table for a podcast discussion. We sat down and talked for about 45 minutes. And all we did was tell stories about announcing at the stock car track. And yet over the years in environments from a coffee shop to standing in the driveway to sitting in his living room or at my kitchen table or even back years ago when we used to go to the same fitness center together and we would play squash for a while at about 7 o'clock in the morning, and then we'd go and sit and bake in the sauna, and while we would sweat all our troubles out, we'd sit and we'd talk about life. And we would share the challenges that we were facing, some of the things that we were trying to deal with. And I think Derek would also tell you that we were always really good at listening to each other with empathy and compassion, and we were able to impart some perspective back to the other that we wouldn't necessarily be able to give ourselves. And I really wanted to have the opportunity to be able to bring Derek back, both selfishly for me, to celebrate the first anniversary, really, of of this podcast existing, to bring back the guy who started it with me, but also so that I can share with you the incredibly kind, compassionate, empathetic, soul that Derek has, uh, the wisdom that he offers, and just the incredible energy that uh, if you, you get the chance to get to know him, you would know. And I think it'll, it'll come across in this conversation. Now, <laughs> I got what I wanted. I've listened back to this chat a couple of times, and it's, it's very indicative of the talks that we have had over the years, but it probably goes a little bit deeper. And I'm guilty of having manipulated this chat as well, because as you hear, when we started, Derek gets talking a little bit more about his uh, voice acting and the voice talent work that he's doing. But what I really wanted to get into with Derek is the fact that as his buddy and as the person that has described him as I just have, so you know how I feel about him, what I will tell you to set up this conversation is that he seems more content now than I've ever seen him. Everybody that I've talked to on this podcast and the people that I hear from that listen to it all seem to be searching for that contentment, happiness. It's what we all want. He's just, my buddy Derek is just exuding that right now. And trust me, he and I, with all these chats over the years, we've been searching for it. So I wanted to dive into... What went into that? I know that he had to make some major decisions. I know he had to do some things that felt really risky to him. I know that he went through some stuff that was really difficult to be able to get there. And I wanted to share that with you. And I also know that there are some other layers that I could peel off in some other areas that he would have some great insight to share. And he did. So this is very much a conversation as opposed to a traditional interview. And I hope that you'll feel like you're sitting right in on it. And when something comes up that you want to chime in and share on on the subject matters that Derek and I are going back and forth on, by all means, contribute. You can do that in the comment section on the blog post at noschedulemancom for this episode or if you find it on YouTube or anywhere, but absolutely add something in if you want. Now, here are some of the key things that stood out for me from this discussion with Derek. When you listen through it, see if you agree and let me know. Number one, the incredible power of letting go, whether it's of stuff, of ideas. There are all kinds of things that we discuss as far as that's concerned, but I think Derek has some great thoughts to share about the power of letting go. Number two, I'm going to call it reframing regret. So looking back at some of the things that knowing what you know now, you may have done differently. And how do you view those things? And Derek has, I think, a real healthy way to be able to to view that. I'll leave it at that and let you listen. And number three, I'm going to call this getting to the cause as opposed to the symptom and also choosing which example or path you wish to follow. So we covered a lot of different territory, bringing up things like (laughs) Christmas, alcohol, media. We even throw in a few bands where I tell an Aerosmith story and 
various stages of those journeys and the journeys and the evidence that's available to us in terms of what the potential consequences might be of following a certain path. So why do we choose the one that we seem to continue to choose? We get into that in a whole lot more. I hope you enjoy it. This is my conversation with my great good friend, Derek Botton on the No Schedule Man podcast. By my best count, we're coming up on a couple decades since you and I crossed paths. Which is funny because I'm only 25. (laughs) I don't know that I have ever seen you happier from what I perceive. How do you feel hearing something like that from me? And how accurate do you think it would be? Well, I I recall that it must be the day that I've chosen to wear my fur-lined underwear. That helps, that, does uh, it? It puts a smile on my face. We're not going to go enduro on this thing, are we? <laughs> no. You have to listen back to episode one if you want to get that reference. No. And maybe content is a better word than happy. Is you that know, fair to you say? Know, that's that's absolutely valid. I um, uh, have had I've, I've gone through the entire cycle, and and those that know me know me probably from radio. Um, and I went through all of that uh, unceremoniously punted from the business, which at first you take whenever you're fired from somewhere, you kind of feel, oh, no, I'm, this is it. I'm done. And why don't they like me anymore? But you rationalize your way around it and go, okay, well, they're, they're making way for a different style, a different group, whatever, and didn't include me. So that's fine. So, so for me, when I first got let go, I, I thought, okay, I better find a job real quick. I've got obligations here, financial obligations. So I did. I got a job, and I was doing sales for a while, and I, about a year into it, I just kind of went, you know what? <sighs> okay, that was a good stopgap measure. I, it, it served the purpose at the time, but what do I really want? I, I don't know about you, but I noticed the calendar. I can't even see the calendar because it's going by in such a blur. Yeah. You know? And, and I, I find that as I get older, it gets worse. It's more of a blur. It's like, wow, it's been five weeks since I, you know whatever and and you just kind of think did i enjoy today the best way i could have and my answer when i was when i get home from doing a full day of retail sales i go no it's boy i i stuck there i couldn't do this i couldn't satisfy this i had had um before i left radio i i've always loved the voice work aspect of it um and i had started off doing some freelance voice work i bought some equipment and set myself up and some of those, they call them these days, they call them pay-to-play sites like Voices.com and Voice123, um, where you pay for a membership, and then they send you leads, and you audition your face off. And it's just a numbers game. Uh, I was 270-something auditions at Voices before I got my first job. you got to be pretty committed to doing it hmm. to last that long. But I, but I enjoyed doing it, and I realized that in the voice world, there was... It, very little of my radio training, which was a, a, a really a revelation to me, uh, was was sort of what the voice world needed right now. They don't want a Sunday, Sunday, but or you know, um, that's not what they're looking for. And I again started radio in the late '70s, so I mean that that was still kind of in vogue. I mean, you, you learn to project, and you learn to enunciate, and you learn to you know because it's the only you don't you can't see my arms moving up and down, but they are because you know, well that's. That's just me trying to make a point. Uh, but anymore, it seems like what they're looking for is your buddy. Hey, have you tried this new foot itch medication? <laughs> hey, Kev, does your foot itch too? You know, instead of going, ha ha, we've got the cure for your foot itch. It's like, you have this problem too? Well, do what I do. And it, so it's a, a very different approach in in advertising and presentation of things. So... I'm saying an awful lot of words to to come down to the point of things have changed a lot. And I had to start from square one. So for me, whatever I thought I might have known after decades of doing radio, it turns out I didn't really know. And the only thing I had going for me was my health. That That's not a take any credit for that. Um, and the fact that I love reading. So reading has always come easily to me, and I, and I think I read pretty well. I can read out loud. And we're, for some people, that's perhaps an acquired skill. Anyway, doing it, I thought, okay, I'm starting from that. I have to learn how to use my voice again. I have to learn how not to, I have to reel in the projection, and I have to 
try my hand at all kinds of different things because I don't even know what they want. Do they want commercials? Do they want uh, an explainer video? Do they want an audio book? There's all kinds of ways that you can get work in the voice world. And so that's what I've started to do. And it's, it's kind of felt like going back to school for the past year or so. But I'm doing it full time and, uh, and I'm loving it. I re- I'm loving it. It's just, yeah, content, damn straight. It's, um, I really feel good about sort of reinventing myself and trying a new, new direction. The conversations that we've had over the years have touched on the idea of, am I really happy? Am I doing what I want? Because both of us have been through a number of changes and challenges, and I don't think either one of us have ever shied away from taking on the challenge. So I'm suggesting, Derek, that I think you've asked yourself that question in different forms all along the journey, but what was it that was different about it this most recent time when you were in, as you say, retail sales, where you were really becoming aware of the calendar flipping by and saying, am I really doing what I want? Am I really happy? What was the difference that time? Other than the cumulative effect of past experience, I don't know that there was a specific thing. My state of mind now, I think, in, in and I, I attribute this partly to age, which is a sum total of experiences, is, you know what? I, I don't need to be first, best, highly regarded, liked. I don't need any of that stuff. And a lot of that goes into making a decision when you're looking at picking a vocation or doing something. Very, well, uh, are they going to like me? Are they gonna? Am I gonna? Am I gonna be best at this? Can I do really well at that? And you know what? I don't have that need. I don't. And maybe that's the, the. If anybody's looking to get into entrepreneurship, thinks they have to have the killer instinct, and they, you know, I'm gonna work, uh, you know, eighteen and a half hours a day, and I. Uh, I don't have that. What about safe? You talked about. I don't feel yeah. like I need to have the first yeah. or best. Or what about excellent? Excellent question. And this isn't safe. This isn't safe at all. But is the other? Well, okay, fair enough. Probably not any safer, but this is the sort of thing that it's it's more of a personal thing. It's more of a personal challenge that I'm taking on, and I will win or lose. I will fail or, or succeed all by myself, not because of or due to or in the company of anybody else. This is a, a very personal thing. And I'm you, – you said it before – you and I have both approached life with a, well, let's just try it. We're, we're not playing it safe. But I don't, if, if this fails, I know I got enough skills and enough something. I'll be okay. I don't know doing what, but I'll be okay. Well, I think even the measurement of what success means and what failure might mean has changed. Given that you, you talked about not needing to be first or best and that you did 200 something auditions before you got your first job with with that so this is what really fascinates me about it rock is that the whole criteria it sounds like of how we judge things up to a certain point all of a sudden fractures and 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 opens up well i've done 270 something auditions it would be real easy to look at that as a failure i'll do the 280th or the next one comes or you know what success is because What I know is that for both of us, our lifestyles have changed. There are things you've given up that I think from knowing you, you held on to tightly as part of your identity and what you felt like was a part of enjoying your life, that some of those things have been allowed to go adrift for the time being. And yet here you are arriving at a greater state of contentment. So it almost seems paradoxical, doesn't it? It does, and I guess it, it's a, a good, it's a thing, it speaks to the fluid definition of success or contentment, I think, at least for me, what goes on with me. Um, to, to back up a little bit, I, since I left radio, I had a ponytail for, ponytail for 20-something years. I cut it off. That, was that an identifying factor for me? Sure. A lot of people, are, that guy with the ponytail, I don't have that anymore. It's just me and my head. Um, I I did the bike show for 10 years and I was really I loved doing it it was you know for what it was was it 10 years? Yeah. Wow. And now 
it's gone and I, I don't miss doing it. I'm glad I had the experience, but it's, yeah, I wouldn't want to do it. Even if it presented itself again right now, I'd go, yeah, no, I've, I've been there, done that. And I had my, my motorcycle, the last of the Harley, which I bought brand new and was in, completely proud of. And I'm, I'm a motorcyclist and here's what I got. And you know what? I sold that last year. I sold it to get, to make sure I had some cash to fall back on until this voice thing pay, started paying enough to feed me bacon. <laughs> uh, and, and as it turns out, I went at the end of the season last year and bought another motorcycle, a smaller, cheaper, older one, but that's okay. I have a motorcycle to ride, but it doesn't have to be a Harley. It's just a motorcycle and two wheels. And so, but, but does that, do I feel in any way diminished or, uh, demasculated, demasculated? Is that the word? Um, taken away any of my power because of that? No, no, not at all. I'm stuff is stuff. You have it, it goes, you get more. If you want it, how much of that then relates more toward really understanding deeply? I was going to say what it is that you need. That's not what I want to say or how I want to say it, but what well, makes me happy? Yeah, or what at least feeds that. Because to give you some context, one of the things that I've become aware of is how much <clears throat> for the first good part of my life. <clears throat> pardon me, I was attaching that thought to something external, whether it be a bike or a job or whatever it might be. Yep. And that's not to say that there aren't things that exist in the physical world that are are external that don't influence my sense of contentment and pleasure, but I find that happens more now from the inside out than the outside in. So yeah. knowing to be able to let go of something, how does that manifest for you in terms of making those decisions and then still kind of feeding and manifesting that contentment? You know what? Letting go of stuff is very freeing. You hear people talking about decluttering your house and, and giving up some stuff. that you, you surround yourself with your stuff. It's yours. You look around. Yep, I must be home. This is my stuff. And to give some of that up, initially it's like, yeah, I'm giving away my stuff. My, but you know what? There's other stuff. There's lots of other stuff that I will call mine if I want to, if I don't. But it, the, the but it's freeing, and it's. I think that's part of the part of the thing um, accepting and embracing change, allowing things to be different. You know, gets you out of a rut, makes you see things more freshly, and that's both in doing stuff and surrounding yourself with stuff. Um, and so toss away what isn't working for you. Or toss away something to, to shake it loose and then replace it or fill that gap with something else. It's, it's, I think it's, it's really, it's freshening. You, you end up freshening your life <clears throat> and lightening your load too, I think. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question or not exactly. Well, it certainly touches on it. And I'm going to haul us back again to where we were a couple of minutes ago because I really... The listener doesn't have the benefit of the context of all the conversations that you and I have had over the years in the coffee shop and sitting in the sauna and, and all those times where I wouldn't even want to guess, Derek, at how many times we've had chats just about life. So I know I'm in part to some... It's funny because I'm only 25. <laughs> I know. <laughs> You're wise beyond your years. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to impart to somebody that's listening now. This isn't the first time we've tried to have this conversation or to air quote figure it out and maybe it's embracing the idea that it's not to be figured out or it can't be that it's to be experienced but again to where we were a few moments ago it's not as if I haven't seen you ask is this what I really want to be doing and am I really happy many times over the last couple of decades we've known each other so there was something in the water that was different this last time Maybe it's unanswerable, but I'm trying to probe to get into the, you know, knowing to trust yourself. And like Steve Harvey says, at some point you've got to jump. You shoot can't open if you don't go off the edge of the cliff. And some of the things that you did where you just put your hands up and said, I'm done with this. I'm going to follow my own spirit in essence and be true to that. And what happens, happens. But then that means you have to trust yourself to evaluate what happens and what, if anything, to do about it as well. So there's just an enormous amount of 
trust and self-confidence there when I could maybe suggest that this had been tried in some forms several times over the years. I think now I'm talking around to answering my own question, but maybe I'll just put it this way. Did it feel different this last time when you yes. decided to make the change? Yes. So what about it felt so I think, different? <clears throat> I think the start of the start of it for me was was forced. I, I've I've asked myself the question a few times. If I hadn't got punted from the radio station, would I still be there? And in all likelihood, and I can't say for sure, but in all likelihood, yeah, probably. Probably I would still be there. Because I was, you know, was doing what I wanted in my hometown, doing a format I liked, and, and things were going along okay. But to get rudely shaken out of that little, that little place you're at and suddenly find yourself on the sidewalk going, okay, now what? So I had some scrambling to do, and I had to sort of figure out, and I had to rationalize, and I had to sort of wrap my head around it. Then I, I by my own choice, took on another job. And then by my own choice and figuring, okay, I mean, that was a reactionary thing was to get another job right away. But then after I was in it for a while, I kind of went, Ugh, really, do I really want this? I, it, so, so having had the initial shakeup, I think, of being fired, which will do it to a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of intense you know, medical issues that happen to people or, or things like getting fired or, or relationship breakups, things like that will tend to sort of ignite a bunch of different processes in a person's head. And in my case, getting fired, and it's like, uh, uh, okay, now I, I got to look around here. And I, and I went down to the, um, actually to the employment seminar, and they did a little, one of those what colors your parachute kind of a things for a couple of days you worked out what it is you would. So what, what would you rather do? Would you rather uh, work in a sewing shop or would you rather fix airplane engines? Oh, okay, I'd rather fix airplane engines. Okay, would you rather mold clay or would you rather work on uh, uh, doing brain surgery? Oh, I'd rather mold clay. And in, in the process, that process, you kind of, and again, it, it's not something that a lot of people in middle age who have gone along status quo for a long time will consider. But suddenly when your world is shaken loose, you kind of go, okay, now I, A, I have a chance to, to figure out this. I have a chance to leap into something new. And B, I have a, the, a whole bunch of collected experience that I can draw upon to see what the next good move is for me. And, and I'm one of those that's always tried to figure out what it is I'm here to do. I, I have often said, I'm, Still trying to figure out what I want to be when I grow up, but and and what I what it's come down to for me is, I think everybody has gifts. Everybody has certain abilities and talents. My brother is a musician of the highest order. He can play anything on just about any instrument, and I just look at him and go, "Where did that come from? I can't pick up one. I don't know one end of a guitar from the other." And it, and I'm I've observed that thinking, okay, well, I guess I don't have that gift. And then I thought, well, you know, I've, I've, in radio, I'm, well, I've ab honed my ability to talk. It, it's not something really and truly, uh, as I have assessed it since, that I'm that comes first off to me. I'm not. I've never been the the wannabe orator. Is you know, I just never. It's never. It's part of the job. So that's kind of what I did. Um, so that's that wasn't really using any of my given abilities i don't think and i think that one of the things that i that i have that i have a ability to work with my hands and the ability to figure things out and to build stuff and to just play with things in my hand and i have always found that doing that stuff when i do it i get lost in it and i get lost in it for a couple hours and i go how long has it been it's been 15 minutes it's been two hours you've been in the <laughs> workshop and it's like oh my and and really and truly that to me is what defines what I love to do because it doesn't feel like I've been toiling for two hours. It feels like a couple of minutes have passed and I've just, I walk out of there with this big banana eating grin on my face. And, and so one of the other things that I do, and I've, I've had this workshop out in the backyard for a bunch of years and never, it's always just been a big storage locker. I've kept stuff in it. Got a bigger space. You fill it with more stuff as George Carlin used to say, but now I've started to, to work it and to organize it a little bit and to actually set it up so that I have a little workshop in there. And I love it. I go out there and I just 
get lost in it. See, the script, the one that I perceived I was supposed to follow, would suggest that you can't be in that state and do what you love and still make a living, let alone a comfortable living, in the context of that. What I'm learning through the course of my own journey, and especially those like you that have been so generous to share time on that this podcast, is that the script is bullshit. But we've chosen to agree to it. Yep. And this is why I've been hammering you about the what was it that was different about that most recent time of evaluating your life. It was looking at that script and going, you know what? <laughs> it's time for you and I to break up. I'm pitching you out the window. Um, but that state of creativity, Derek, before we turned on the microphones, you and Lisa were showing me around the house and you were showing me some of the creations that you had made. And it reminded me of like when my kids were a little bit younger and you go into the class and they're so proud they just want to show you what they had done. There's a plasticine dinosaur and this is a paper mache mask of my mom. And <laughs> I mean, it is a compliment no, because know, it's really difficult to be, to have your energies tied up, in my opinion, into these bigger issues that I think we may be manifest as air quote adults when you're in that creative state that you just described. And, you know, the idea of creativity versus competition, this could spin into a much larger conversation. But for whatever reason, my perception is that we collectively, at least here in North America, don't think that it's responsible or doable to be in that state, almost like that state has to be earned by doing the job or feeding the economy or making the widgets or whatever it might be and building your pension and investing for your retirement. And we're programmed wrong from the get go. This is what I'm getting at. Yep. And I, my observation of you is that you're living proof of that. Yep. And I'm at the stage of knowing that and haven't gone completely off the cliff yet, but wanting to impart to people that find conversations like this and listen to them and consider and digest them I would think that somebody's still not still listening this far into the conversation without maybe evaluating some of those things in their own life here's Kevin he's on the top of the hill looking down <laughs> here's Derek he's toiling <laughs> have you seen the Eddie the Eagle movie no it's a fun 90 minutes <laughs> Sounds like maybe I'm living it. Oh, what can I say? It's um, But I made a list of a couple of different things, and there's one word at the top of it, and it says regret. That's not the word that I want, but more when you look back on your past experiences, how you view the things that if you could go back and do them again, knowing that you, there's no substitute for if the things hadn't happened the way that they did, you wouldn't be who you are now. But I also feel anybody that says that they don't have regrets, I guess depends on what word you want to attach to that. I think everybody does. I do, but I'm interested in how you view those things that you would do differently if if you could. Yeah, I and I get that. And I, I also subscribe to the theory that no matter where you are in life, you're the sum total of your existence, mistakes, and successes. And that's kind of what, what molds you and makes you who you are. But if I could take me now at my age and zoom it back to being 20 years of age, knowing what I know now, I would, I would be on an entirely different path than the one I had taken. But, but I mean, that's really just fantasy. It's fairy, book, fairy tale stuff because yeah. I, I wouldn't have this perspective had I not gone through what I'd gone through. Um, and that's that's the bottom line. I think probably I would have gone back and, and done something that involved working with my hands. I've often thought I would have been a mechanic uh, and that the mechanics would have taken me because I love racing as well as that's where we met uh, to to maybe have been working on a race team or maybe on an NASCAR team to being a, a crew chief or a mechanic. That's where I kind of thought my, my love was with cars and mechanical things. Um, 
but it didn't happen. And the reason why I didn't get into mechanics and take it in school and become a licensed technician and what have you is because I always thought I don't want to ruin my love of this by having to do it for a job. <laughs> and that was perhaps echoed in agreement by my dad, who was very old school and very, you know, uh, stay the stay the course and have a something to fall back on, and but make sure you have a career path. He was always very much like that because that was his experience and that was his the path he chose. But if I was to do it again, having to do something to have something to fall back on or having to, to, to make a living at it, sort of knowing in advance or trying to predict in advance what the outcome was going to be, um, I would say that's, that's entire rubbish at this point. It's just, no, there's no setting yourself up for with, with these expectations and then suddenly not achieving them or it, it makes you not willing to, to veer off course if something else pulls you one way or the other. It, you, you, you kind of feel blinkered um, on this path. No, I can't do that because I said I was going to get, uh, you know, a house paid for by the time I was 40 or so, whatever. There's so many different levels of, of um, that people point you to that say you must achieve this and this is what success is. Uh, we are, I think we're completely brainwashed. That's what it is. And, and if I had one piece of advice to give my 20-year-old self – it would be, don't be brainwashed. Go with your heart, you know? Do something that you love doing. And it, it might sound cliche that um, if you do what you love doing, that, uh, you know, the, the money will follow. You hear people say that, you know what? It, it will, or you don't need that money anyway. <laughs> the trappings that come along with it, again, part of the brainwashing, I think, is that you have to follow this path because... You must have this house, and you must have this truck, and you must have this fine clothes, and you must have this electronic equipment, and you must have all these things. Right? That's what we've been told by any advertisement going since we were this tall. And that's just a lot of hokum. That's, that, to me, is the brainwashing. The, the commercialism of, of our world in our time has just made us banish our dreams because what is a dream? It's some airy-fairy concept that a... Uh, you know, that a dope-smoking um, sitar-playing Maharaji might have told the Beatles in the 60s, but that's not for me, you know? I have to follow this path of my straight-laced father, who was an accountant and had provided for his family and had a house in the suburbs and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I think I'm getting off course, but... <laughs> I, I think if you... if I Again, back to the... To, to bring it back on a track, to, to be... True to yourself. Um, it's funny, that's, that same brother who has the, the musical gift um, was also strongly suggested by my father uh, that he have a career to fall back on, not just music. Which is a slap in the face to any musician, any working musician out there, but also to anybody that has, has a gift and has some inclination that way. You know what? Go do it. And if you've done it and then it doesn't work out the way you think it should or the way it's managed, if it's not manageable, okay, then try something else. But at least you'll have that under your belt. The way that you described the mechanics and, and the handiwork and all of that and not wanting to make that your living is mirrors how I've felt about my interest in music and songwriting, where I just didn't want to put that drudgery in. And, and yet it's one of those things that is this uh, murmur that no matter how much I try to quash it, through the course of the journey and trying to do what I think I quotes should be doing, it just keeps popping up. And the same is true for you with, with all this creativity and to give some context about the thing of, of regret. And again, that's not the word I want, but maybe it'll help if, if I lend to the conversation that I'm also coming at this as a dad. You know, so my older son just turned 14 at the time of this recording and I'm not wanting to get in the way of, of he and his brother shaping their experience, but I desperately am aware of being very open with them about here's what I did and here's why I chose what I did and here's how I might have chosen differently and here are the things I'm grappling with now. And I'm watching my older son specifically deal with and process things from a level of what I would call Derek 
emotional maturity or intelligence that I didn't have until I was about four decades in. Didn't even know what was out there to even look at, and he's already dealing with it. And then I'm also thinking about, um, I've done a couple of videos just for fun on my YouTube channel where one of our little buddies who plays on Jaden's hockey team, kid named Jeffrey, comes along with us. And maybe by the time somebody's hearing this, maybe I'll have done this. Forgive me for taking this over and, and taking this on a tangent. But I've thought about doing a video blog with this kid, Jeffrey, where I sit him down and I ask him, do you know what the Tao is? <laughs> so that I can tell him and I can share the passage in that with him about how the supreme good is like water, which nourishes all things without even trying to. And to let him know you're water just by being who you are. He's like this little piece of sunshine. Yeah. That just by being in his company, everybody else around him feels good. And I have this feeling now while we're sitting here of just going, oh man, I just, I don't want the world to dull that shine. Yeah. You know, what could I do to encourage or to basically what you just said? You know, don't buy into it. And, and so I, I find this this all hopeful because I think that, <laughs> as we've seen from our neighbors to the south, we have a lot further to go in evolving as emotionally intelligent beings, in my opinion, than maybe we we think we do. Um, But that's more of a soliloquy than a question. But do you understand kind of the context, I guess, of where I'm I'm getting at that it's it throws it into a different perspective when you're thinking about your kids that are really just kind of starting out on the journey, knowing what we know now this far into it. I think that's why the, the there's so much um, smiles and good feeling about the uh, kids say the darnest things and the, the old, all the old, right from Art Link letter to Bill Cosby to whatever is followed of asking kids to comment on things and why it's so funny or seems so funny to us because we, as adults, have been conditioned to, oh, we couldn't possibly say that. Well, I want to be a fairy and, and go in a spaceship and live on Mars. You know what? God bless you. Go. Go on. Give it a try. Go for it. Don't say no to a kid like that. Encourage them, right? And by one way or another, they will either pursue it and, and either get shot down or have success at it or may change course along the way. I want to be a cowboy now. <laughs> okay, there you go. Go be a, you know what I mean? Where where we were told, I'll speak for myself, where I was told, no, this is, you need to follow a path of security and this and, you know, being all this. And it was all good things and based in in things that I, to the my dad's, the best knowledge he had and the best advice he was trying to give us. I don't fault him one bit for it. But it was his path and where he came from and he kind of, lived through the depression and had a, a whole different sense of what was possible and what to take for granted and what you needed to have and what you make sure you were secure. And, and I, and I say all of these things with the proviso that I have had and lived a charmed life. I, you know, I have, we haven't known war. Uh, we haven't known some of the, some of the, um, the atrocities that continue to this day in this world. Uh, you know, but some countries that live with tanks driving up and down the street or, or you know, not walking in the path in the woods because there might be a, a landmine in it. Like, we don't know. So I can say this, and I don't mean to be uh, a smug North American, but I just this is just my my world and what I've known about it. This is the, the existence that I've had. And I, you can be anything. You can you can do anything, in my opinion. Um. But do something that makes you happy. Don't don't be don't be chasing the dollar. So bringing it back around to a kid, you know, at at every opportunity, I think we should tell kids, encourage their dreams, and tell them there's no limitations. You want to do this? Okay, figure out a way how. Don't just give it to them, but put it on in a way that okay, go for it. Well, two things that are rattling around in my mind are number one. <clears throat> how tenacious kids are. They don't really perceive the obstacles. They just want what they want. Yep. And then they figure out a way to be able to go and get it. And then the other is context. 
of how many times do you hear from people after they've they've grown that when they reflect back on their childhood they'll say things like you know, we didn't know that we were poor or we didn't know that we were middle class or whatever we just knew that that we we, we were us yeah and we did with what we had and that's where then that creativity aspect comes in so it's only i think after the fact that all these external measurements start to fall in and the other thing at the point where I'm at, Derek, is that once you start to build in some self-awareness of your own thoughts and patterns, and maybe that's where the regret thing comes in, is not so much what do I regret, but what can I be honest with myself having built a, a certain level of self-awareness that, that I can look back and see what are the patterns? What did I choose when I got to these different points and why? And what were some of the things that influenced me and maybe who I was listening to or what I thought I was supposed to do. Where'd that come from? Not in a manner of placing blame, but in taking responsibility for one's own choices and actions. That has made me hyper aware of how much I'm able to project my own thoughts and feelings influences onto my kids without even trying to. And it's frightening it's frightening how easy that is to do. That's just my opinion. You could disagree with it. Others could take it or leave it. But then when I think about extrapolating that onto a larger context, I had a hockey game on last night, the TV on, and there were only like a two-minute commercial break. And my reaction to it was just, whoa, like, <laughs> this is just... You're barraging me with this is what I'm supposed to do in order to be X. God bless you, but I don't believe that anymore. And it's a sea change from how I've lived the first few decades of my life. Can you relate to what I'm... Oh, totally. Absolutely. I, in fact, I, I stay away from as much media as I can, if that's fair to say. I still choose to... to Consume media, but it's on my terms. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to sitting and just having it blast at me because it's eight o'clock and I normally watch TV at eight o'clock. I just and and what 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 comes at me? It's I I watch very little except for maybe live sports. Uh, that's that's on the the television. Other than the PVR, I'll record stuff ahead of time. That way, I can skim through the commercials if I don't want it. And I just and it's my choice on my terms when I want to for as much as I want. Which is it? Which technology has made possible? Um, I, I, anything that comes at me, I just I, I turn away from it. All, like exactly what you're saying. The, it's like, oh man, it's too loud. It's too in my face. I don't want to do that. You're not talking to the right guy. Go find someone who cares. Um, and I, you know, it's it's funny. We've not that long ago had about a month ago had Christmas. And and Christmas was always special for me when I was growing up as a kid because it was something that was a real family time for us. And I have very fond memories of it when I was a kid. Uh, curiously, when I got into radio somewhere in my 20s, experiencing Christmas was suddenly a whole different thing. I, I then found out what it was like to work on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day and over the holidays and New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. And I, because that's radio never shuts off. And I did all those shifts along the way. Also, the lead up to Christmas was just crazy for commercials and all the busy stuff that you had to do and promotions. And it's, everything was just, it was like being rammed down my throat, being in the middle of it going, oh, this is not what Christmas is about. And it totally turned me off celebrating Christmas the traditional way i think i it anything about it when i as soon as sometimes even before halloween comes and there's christmas ads that pop up or christmas displays in store i just go go away from me and and as a result my take on the whole thing is far different than it used to be but it's because of that incessant nattering telling me what i have to do what i should do what i you know um so, I mean, there's an example of how that is for me. And so my reaction to it now is not to consume it, is to, in fact, to, is to run from it, to turn it off, turn it down, or go the other way. We touched on, oh gosh, I'm trying to remember exactly what it is that you said 
It made me think about this several minutes ago. For the sake of moving on, I'll just call it feeding this idea of what we're supposed to do. And my perception is that we have built entire economies out of feeding ourselves things that make us emotionally and physically sick (laughs) and then (laughs) selling ourselves products and solutions that treat the symptoms and not the cause. I remember a conversation I had with you, Derek. It would have been around 2005 because it was in late 2004 that I was made the manager of the racetrack at Delaware. I remember exactly where I was sitting. I was still in the car and I was up on the hill by the little trailer. Uh, I had been to the doctor a couple of times to have them monitor my heart because I was having pains in the left side of my chest. Stress. You know, I can see that now and I didn't wasn't equipped to handle what I was doing. But I remember the conversation I had called you because I remember I said, um, I think I got an issue with how much I'm drinking. It's funny what you hold on to. Because I remember you saying, well, Kev, that's, and I'm paraphrasing, that's a really personal choice. And never said, you should do this or you should do that or not do this or not do that. But I know if you don't mind me sharing, you still make a point of going and visiting with people that are struggling with that and speaking to them, do you not? I'll back up even further. For anybody that's never even heard of me or listened to me speak before, I am a recovering alcoholic. And I am, at the time of this this little session, a little better than 19 years clean and sober. Yeah, and I still do certain things that help me stay clean and sober. Uh, and one of them is going into the to the detox. And... Just talking, because that's all it is, is just talking to people who are trying to suddenly come to terms with this substance abuse issue. And it's funny, when we go up there, I I don't, and I say in in these words, we're not experts at anything. We're just examples of, we were just like you, now we are here. If you want what we've got, some things that we can tell you about that we did that helped us get here. and And so you can't say that your solution, and this applies to anything, but yeah. it, you can't say that your solution is the only one or it's the best one. Well, in my experience, this is what worked for me. And this is what I did. I'll answer any questions based on my own experience. And that's it. <laughs> you know, I didn't write the book. I don't know how anybody else deals with it. And there's other people who have been through stuff. I can't hope to understand, but yeah, it's, um, so it's a, it is a, it's a very personal thing. And I couldn't say to anybody else whether they whether they consume too much. It's That's their choice. It's their understanding of what too much means, I guess. Well, the bigger reason I think I bring this up is, is more the why than the how much. And that was something that took me, as you'll remember, well over a decade to resolve for myself. <laughs> and maybe why I've taken us into the context of you volunteering your time and bless your heart for doing that. Although I'm guessing you get just as much out of it than the people that you're talking to. Um, That's a fact. I, I'm curious as to some of, of, of the whys. I'm guessing there are some faces that you see come and go some maybe once and then never again. Um, but back to the point about the building, the awareness, it wasn't until I was, equipped with the ability to be able to objectively look at the why I was doing anything before I could start to turn it or shift it a different way. And for me, it was one of many things that was a trying to treat the symptom of following the script and not even knowing that I was out of balance and and not happy. But I was looking, and I'm not blaming anybody. I was just looking around and watching everybody else. And well, this is just what I'm supposed to be doing. And I would mention it to my doctor even, and I would mention it to other people. And they would say, I don't think, I don't think there's a problem here. You know, you never drink during the day. You've never had an issue as a parent you've never had you never missed work you never and no I never I just I'd come home at night and I'd automatically reach for a Bud Light without even thinking about it but I knew I just didn't really know why 
And so I'm just curious about some of the people you meet, stories you hear, results that you maybe see or don't see by, by interacting with people that because I'm guessing that if they're at that, as you say, detox, they've come to a certain point of going like something needs to change, but I, I don't know how, or I don't. Yep. You know. Yeah, sure. You you get to a point where you're fed up. You're sick and tired of being sick and tired is one of the things we'll say. And it's nice to have essentially a place like that where like a lot of the rehabs are, are just, it's like a pause button. It's like, okay, I'm going to put a pause in the outside world. I'm going to isolate in here for a few, few days, a few weeks, whatever the length of time it is. And as soon as my head gets clear enough to think for itself again, instead of automatically going through all the processes that I would do in a given day and end up suddenly having consumed too much at the end of the day and not knowing why. When you pause and change your surroundings or change things, then you get a, a fresh take on it. And especially in the cases of, of places like detox or places like, like rehabs, you're surrounded by people who get it, who've been there and who understand what you're going through. So you're right. We tend to, when we go through life, it's, it's the, the story about the last one to, to notice how hot the, the water on the stove is, is the frog that's in the pot or some, I, that's poorly put, but I mean, the, the, you go through something and then you compensate for it and you adjust and you adjust in your life on a day-to-day -day basis until one day you, you look around and you go, holy crap. Why is this really? I did, I'm, then I'm suff suffering from this, or you know, I've got I've got ulcers, and I've got I'm fatigued, and I'm all this stuff is going on. It's and you, it's not those things. Those are the symptoms of the other stuff that you're doing to yourself, or putting in your body that um, your body's reacting to. It's trying to get your attention, trying to say, hey, hey, what about me? <laughs> and and I have always described um, alcohol in my world as a symptom to the mental illness that I now understand that I have. And, and a lot of it is, um, it, it's, it's has to do with all sorts of fear and self-esteem and, and, uh, it's inside stuff. And once you clear the substance away that you've been trying to, trying to put on to, to, uh, cover it up, if you will, uh, then it's there in all of its raw, jagged, sharp edges and then you gotta, then you gotta do something to cast it off. And you can, you gotta, you gotta take it, you hold it up, you dig. It's like digging into a big, big dark sack, and you pull something out, and you look at it and go, oh, good, that's ugly. Ooh, nope, gotta get rid of that. No place for that in my world now. And one little bit at a time, um, you can start addressing some of that. At least that's my experience. So, um, and then you realize that okay, those were all. So all the things that I was feeling were symptomatic of the grief that was going on inside my system because of it. But it's, it's not the, the fault wasn't in the sore joints and the indigestion and the, and the bad sleeping, the faults were inside and they were manifesting themselves in a way to try and get my attention. That's how I understand it anyway. So it still comes back down to basically really knowing and understanding yourself, which is the never ending quest from day one. That's what we've been trying to do. And we get really off track, a lot of us, for a long time, I think, until you just kind of go, yeah, you know what? None of that matters. <laughs> I, we've had a lot of conversations about, well, a lot of things, but I'm going to bring music up here. Yep. I was listening to uh, Aerosmith on the way over here. Excellent. A, uh, a live album and listening to some of their earlier jams done after the band. That's my favorite is when a band has been together for a long, long time and a live version of one of their earlier cuts when they've just been living and breathing it for a while. But I was thinking about Aerosmith and if you know about anything about those guys, <laughs> I got thinking, well, there, there, there are one of three ways that this can go. You can, you know, go this route of, of excess and substance and stay on that path and it'll eventually get you like it has so many people in that world or you can do what those guys did you know come out the other side and then in various forms continue to create and to rock and and then there's the third column of everybody hoping that they can be the outlier like keith richards <laughs> <laughs> 
and uh, and have both. But the um, why did I bring that up? Um, oh, for crying out loud! Okay, so it was about I had myself thinking of when I got to the point where I finally put down not just stop drinking alcohol, but dropped some other habits and expectations of the way that I thought things were supposed to be. I deliberately started feeding myself with stories of people like I've mentioned Aerosmith and there were a bunch of people in that band that had big, big substance abuse issues that then there's a before and a during and then there's an after and there were a number of athletes and other people like that whose stories I read to try to give me an idea of what their lives were like leading into and what their lives were like. out. And this is not an anti-alcohol rant, but it's bigger than that. It's star athletes, musicians, actors and actresses that from the outside you would look and say, people love them, they're making tons of money, they're doing what they love. Why aren't they happy? How can that be bad? And that was the part that I wanted to explore of coming out the other side of that. I think, Derek, it's taking all that other stuff away as part of the process of really getting to know who you are and being better with that rather than it still comes back to where we started that that bloody script that well if I can just make this amount of money or if I can just have this amount of fans or if I can just sell this many widgets or CDs or get this movie role or if I can just lend that job but it doesn't exist it's a road to nowhere you know what's interesting though and i because i i favor similar biographies and autobiographies of people like that who have been gone to a dark place and come back out the other end uh, not unlike Steven Tyler's book which i read Joey Kramer Aerosmith's drummer got a book called Hit Hard which is good and he's he's a recovering alcoholic as well uh, Eric Clapton Keith Richards uh, uh Brian Wilson the books that they have they talk about really wanting something badly. It was they, they were consumed with their love for music and they did everything they could. They focused everything on it. And guess what? Suddenly they succeeded and they got it, what they thought they wanted. They hmm. got a chance to perform in front of millions of people. They made millions of dollars. They, they were accolades and everything, except that it suddenly turned on them. And that, uh. and, and I think what they, what they think is the business that, that they love and the, the, you know, suddenly came around and bit them in the ass. It's like, oh man, there's a rude awakening, isn't it? But it wasn't the business that bit them in the ass. It was how they handled the step being when you're, a, I can only imagine when you're a famous musician that sells millions of records, everybody around you, your management, the record company, you're on, wow, you're great. You're doing excellent. You're on top of the world and you've got it all going on. And in fact, they could be lost inside. And listening to all the all the hype that goes on around them, and then sometimes they'd start believing it, or sometimes the drugs and alcohol would would either take the disturbing thoughts away from them, or would augment the yes, I am on top of the world, I'm the best, and I can do this, and they just go off on a different, completely different tangent, leaving behind their love for chord structure and lyrical progression. They they get lost in the success of it, so it. Um, I like those kinds of stories because what happens out the other end, and again, some of those, the, the Joey Kramer, the Eric Clapton, the Brian Wilson, you read their books, and what comes out the other end is a really humbled human being who has been through the ringer. And I, you know what? Sometimes it's funny, I said earlier about uh, my brother and envying his ability for, for um, uh, playing stuff and having a musical gift, which I don't have. I'm not so sure that I'd want that for that reason because it probably would have destroyed me too so given that those stories are in such abundance and so many of us I think are aware of them how you come out the other side why then and I'm projecting now but why then as a culture are we still more focused on the first part of those stories than the second part I can't answer that or I'd be running this culture. <laughs> you know what? It's just, it's greed. It's greed. People, uh, the, 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 all the direction we're given to buy things and stuff, the commercialism that surrounds us is all so that more people will get more of our money and they'll get more rich to do whatever nefarious things they will do with that money. Uh, and they preach it because it's, it's like, 
It's like giving us, basically preaching us an addiction. You will want the, the best shirts and the best shoes and the hottest car. and the, the They kind of hypnotize us into thinking that we want all that stuff for their own means, not for ours. And that's, I can't even remember what the question was at this point now. But um, Well, this comes back again, I think, to what we are barraged with, at least in this society, and then what we as individuals make the the choice of what we're going to agree to and how we're going to think about the world and what we think that we're supposed to do. And maybe it comes down to something as simple as that when we're younger, we're just, I don't even know if this is fair to say, Derek, but I was going to say uh, more susceptible to thinking that, you know, we need to have the glitz and the glamour and the excitement because there's, there's that part of it but there's also the the other part that goes, okay, well, yeah, I did all this. And this is how the whole house of cards came collapsing down. This is what I did about it. And now I'm happier than I ever was. So those examples and those stories are rampant. But as a culture, and I'm generalizing wildly and irresponsibly here, but just in the effort to make a point, I think we're more focused on the first part. I've got to have money. I've got to have fame. I've got to have status. I've got to have whatever in order to what? Justify myself and my own existence? Only individuals can answer those questions. But it's not as if both sides of the coins aren't readily available to all of us. So why do we choose which one we want to pay attention to? Probably because of the narcotic-like effect that we're told happens when we achieve the, the things that they're preaching. When we, oh, you love this new speedy sports car. You'll love this. Uh, we're drawn into that. We're, we're seduced into that, into all the trappings of things. And because it's so widespread and so pervasive, it's pretty tough to, to not want the latest thing that's out there, to not want to improve your, whether it's, I want a new TV because it has higher definition that I'll never be able to see with my, you know, with my own eyes, but they tell me it's better. And, and I want a new car that's faster and more efficient, even though my old one is just fine. Thank you. But I want the new one. We're sold that we're seduced by it. I, and we're all susceptible to that because that's what makes us human. I think, you know, you, I, you'd said before about, um, what the difference we don't have when we're younger. I don't think, we don't have the filters to go, or, the, or the, the bullshit detector. Wait a minute, this is bullshit. He's feeding me a line here. And how do you know that when you're younger? Or when you're, say you're a young musician coming up and working, doing whatever you can, working the, 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 the clubs and you know playing seven nights a week to get that dream, to get that goal, you're, yeah, keep doing it. You'll keep doing it. Come on over to the dark side, come on. When in fact, at some point you go, yeah, that's bullshit. I don't care what you say. I'm being taken advantage of here. I, I'm going to do a record for you, and yet you get 90% of it, and I get 10? What's wrong with that? But when you're, when you're young and climbing, you go, yeah, I'll do that, sure. I, maybe it's just the... Maybe you're more susceptible when you're younger. I, I don't know. So there's an interesting thing going on here, I think, where... Um How do you then balance being aware of that without being kooky maduki hiding out in the basement in your, you know, nuclear bunker because the whole world's out to get you, huh? Versus really opening up and all the way back to where we started of trusting yourself and seeing the good in other people, others, because there's a ton of that out there. More than I think we're being told there is. But do you see where there's a little bit of a, maybe it's paradoxical in the word, that's not the word, but, um, you know, be aware <laughs> of this side, but <laughs> be aware <laughs> of this other side as well. Like you want to be careful, but you want to be open to all this good stuff at the same time. And maybe that's where a lot of us really get scared and don't trust ourselves to be able to wade through that. It's not as glamorous. Being a monk isn't as glamorous as being a movie star. 
Well, I think the picture of it too, right? If you think of, I remember reading Dan Harris's book. I wrote about this, 10% Happier. And the line that jumped right off the page at me is, meditation has a towering PR problem. So in that case, I'm talking about meditations or monk or something like that. But if you say, do what you love, or being an artist, or live with less, what are the pictures that immediately come to mind? Not Living in a grass hut with a dirt floor, playing with a tin can. But it's not reality, and yet these are the pictures that are the defaults that come into our mind, are they not? Yep, absolutely. So... And you're right about, I love that, I love that line about meditation as a PR problem. Because what does meditation ask of you? It asks less. How do you meditate? My experience, think about nothing. Not think about this, not consider that, not aspire to this. Think about nothing. Shut your mind off. And everything that's out there, the, the media, everything that we're being fed is loud and it's intrusive and it gets into us. And that's where that's where this whole the uh, the whole addiction for material stuff comes from and misdirection if you meditate you're just then you're listening more to the inner voice you're giving you're giving the inner voice a little bit of quiet to break through and go hey hey what about me you know there's a i would consider myself very much still a beginner in that whole world but what it has done for me is build just the tiniest little crack of daylight between this synapse in my brain, what comes out of my mouth, or what I act or do. So if we can go back and lay that over top of all of the dozens of things that we've discussed here in the last hour, reacting versus responding and all of those kinds of things. Um, I'm not saying that that's the magic answer, but it helps build that awareness between Okay, all of a sudden everything was going wrong and now it all, or everything was going right and now it feels all wrong. So, what do I do about that? To build a space to have some awareness. Well, everything else is still the way that it was a half hour ago and things felt good, but now it feels wrong. So, what did I used to do in the past? Well, I'd just pour beer on it, among other things, or go buy something, or go eat something, or whatever it might be. As opposed to, what I'm feeling isn't necessarily right or wrong. What I'm feeling is just what I'm feeling. And if I can take some time to really kind of get into that and investigate that and actually allow it, the funny thing that happens is over time it starts to dissolve and you find the good feeling again more quickly, but not without that level of awareness and that willingness to sort of be with whatever is. And so, and I... The, the essence of all of it, I think, is how we react. What, where we, we react in different ways. The world, as, you, as you've identified, the world around us stays the same. All the noise is going to continue. All the trappings, all the things are all still going to be out there. But are we going to react to it or, or respond to it? Or how are we going to respond to it instead that's different? When you say things have changed, no, things haven't changed. It's how we've reacted to them that's changed if, if somebody just to as an example somebody in a room that you're in breaks a plate on the floor some people's reaction is ah, oh no ah. <laughs> and some people go oh you okay exact same situation yeah. two different ways of responding to it not saying one's good bad or otherwise i'm just saying people re- react in different ways to the same thing so the way I react to Christmas now is different. Christmas is still the same. It's all it's out there, but I react differently than I did. And that makes it better for me, for me, my choice. Um, and, and I have said this a ton of times. One of the things that I've gained from the amount of time I've spent being clean and sober um, is I've gained, and I describe it as about a second and a half more reaction time. Yeah. So instead of reacting like that with the immediate way that I always have reacted before, I go <gasps> different. I will react different. The same stuff is out there. The same good things, the same bad things. They're all out there. But how you react is different to it. And some things we, uh, we look at and go, I'm not going to respond. I'm just going to ignore that. Or I'm going to respond in a different way. Or I'm going to turn and go a different course. That That's... That's what I've learned, I guess. That's how I handle myself differently than I did. 
And I guess that's the sum total of my experience is how it manifests itself is I react differently than I did. I don't know. All these things that we've talked about and then back to where we, we started, you know, you know, what's the picture of you know, what you get of somebody who's maybe, you know, feeling more present and living more simply and doing what they love. And you mentioned like the grass hut, <laughs> whatever else. You talked about selling your Harley and moving away from sort of the traditional job and getting into what you're doing. This is a a gorgeous home, which gets even more and more enjoyable to be in every time I visit it. And the energy in here has always been good, but it's never been as good as 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 I felt when I came in here today. You and I have known each other, as I said, a couple of decades. I've never felt more contentment coming from you than than I get these days. And one of the key reasons why I wanted to sit here with you now is that it was almost exactly a year ago that I finally got, okay, well, I, I've been thinking about you know this podcast thing and listening to all the reasons why I can't or shouldn't. How do I get started even though I don't know what I'm doing? Oh, I know. I'll ask my buddy Derek. He'll be my, my <laughs> test guinea pig. And through your generosity and just go, sure, I'm game for that. That was like having a, a missing part of myself reattached. And we're still trying to figure it out. And I guess what I'm trying to suggest by all of that, Rock, is that when you can do that work for yourself and be in that good space, it does have, I think, the ripple, the positive ripple effect onto others whose frequencies get around to matching up with you. And just maybe, as the generations go on, that'll start to make a, a, a bigger difference. Because I'm not here to, to suggest to anyone how they should live their lives. And I don't think you are either. I just want people to be happy. <laughs> yeah. Know? And uh, I just want to be happy. Yeah. And I want them to be happy. I don't need to be right. I just want them to be happy. Uh, every interaction that I've ever had with you over the years has, has made me happy. And uh, so stay tuned on where this goes because it feels like we're just barely getting started, but it wouldn't have started probably without your help. And I, I really want to thank you for that. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for, thanks for being there. It's, um, I, I, I enjoy conversation, whether it solves anything or teaches anything. I, I don't know. It is what it is. But uh, I think by being questioned, by, by having my thinking questioned, it forces me to think more about why I do what I do. So thank you for that. You can reach Derek online. And here's some of his voice work at DerekBotten.com, D-E-R-E-K-B-O-T-T-E-N.com. Also, if you want to see some of the creations that he referenced, he's got some incredible work that he's done. Pieces of furniture, stuff that goes around the house, light fixtures, lamps, all kinds of really cool stuff. That he and his wife, Lisa, they call it Lisa's Pieces. And you can see that stuff by going to voiceoflisabrandt.com and then go to the shop page. Now that's Voice of Lisa. Brandt is spelled B-R-A-N-D-T, voiceoflisabrandt.com and on the shop page. I will post those links on the show notes, the blog post that goes with this episode on my website, noschedulemancom Maybe that's an easy way to remember it and to find it. On Twitter, you can find Derek at Derek Rockbottom, twitter.com slash Derek Rock Botten. I hope you enjoyed the conversation with him. If you did, please reach out to him and let him know. I'd l I know he'd love to hear from you. You can reach me at KevinBolmer.com. NoScheduleman.com takes you to the same place. All my social channel links are up there, as is the email VIP list sign up. I hope you'll join me on this journey, and I would really love to hear from you. Until next time, remember, no plan is all part of the plan. Sometimes, like Derek said, you just got to let go. I'll see you next week when we explore another journey on the No Schedule Man podcast. Just a little day.